Good afternoon. We'll be starting the Knocking at the College Door Data and Implications for the Southern Region webinar in just a few minutes. Good afternoon and welcome to the Knocking at the College Door regional webinar series. The title of today's webinar is Knocking at the College Door Data and Implications for the Southern Region. My name is Demi Michalow and I'm the Vice President for Policy Analysis and Research at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, or WICHE. I'm also a co-author of Knocking at the College Door. I'll be your moderator today and I'm pleased to be joined by a panel of respondents from the Southern Region who will provide insights on the implications of these trends for their state higher education enrollment and access, workforce trends, and state and institutional decision making. WICHE is hosting this webinar today in collaboration with the Southern Regional Education Board, known to many of you as SREB. I want to express my sincere appreciation to my colleagues at SREB for their willingness to work together on this webinar and for their thoughtful contributions. Before we get started, Wichi would like to thank ACT and the College Board for their generous financial support of Knocking at the College Door. Without their partnership and collaboration with us and with each other, these projections would not be possible. And one final note, I'd like to bring your attention to the Knocking hashtag, hashtag Knocking 2016, and please feel free to tweet during the webinar if you're so inclined. First, I'd like to run through a bit of housekeeping information. All attendees will be muted, however you should be able to hear at this point. You can click on the small orange box on the right side of your screen to access the audio tab on the control panel to connect via your computer speakers or to access dial-in information. We'll be taking all questions today via the question box, which you'll also find in the control panel on the right side of your screen. We will monitor and respond to incoming questions and respond as appropriate, so please submit your questions as they come up and we'll respond as we can. We have also set aside time for Q&A toward the end of the webinar. The presentation slides, copies of the knocking report, and a packet that includes the southern region, regional profile as well as individual state profiles are included for you to download from the handouts portion of the control panel. After the webinar concludes, we'll be posting a recording of the presentation on our website and we'll let you know via email when it's available. And finally, you'll be be directed to a brief evaluation of the webinar when you leave the event. We, will rely, we rely on your feedback to improve our webinars and to develop useful resources, so we truly appreciate you taking the time to complete the short evaluation. The following shows our agenda. I will begin with a presentation of the high school graduate trends, then we will hear from our panelists with their impressions of these projections and what they mean for the work that they do. I would like to take just a moment to introduce our panel. And we, we have most of our panel here today, and hopefully um, the, everybody will be able to join us by the time we get to this portion of the webinar. First, we have Susan Lounsbury, who's the Director of Education Data Services from the Southern Regional Education Board. We hope to have Kate Akers, the Executive Director, Kentucky Center for um, 
Education and Workforce Statistics. We have Jean Massey, the Associate Superintendent for Secondary Education and Career and Technical Education at the Mississippi Department of Education. And we also have David Wright, who is the Senior Advisor for Policy and Strategy at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. And as I mentioned, we will conclude with questions from our participants. Wichi has been producing the projections of high school graduates for about 40 years. We make projections for the nation, four geographical regions, and the 50 states in the District of Columbia. For the first time in this edition, we were also able to make projections for Puerto Rico and Guam. Before we discuss the trends, I'd like to mention a few important details about the data. We rely on the most recently available data from two federal data sources, the Common Core of Data and the Private School Universe Survey. For this edition, the 2013-14 school year was the most recent data for the most part, with some variation across public and private school data. So based on the data we use, the projections begin with school year 2013-14 by and large, and the projections extend out to school year 2031-32. From these data, we compute ratios or patterns of progression from grade to grade on to graduation. We use the five most recent years patterns to project the number of students and eventually graduates in the future years. We are able to disaggregate the numbers by race ethnicity for public school students, which are about 90% of the total. We continue to produce detailed numbers in the five long-standing racial ethnic categories for public school students, Hispanics, which include all students of any Hispanic origin, regardless of race, and four non-Hispanic race categories, white, black, Asian Pacific Islander, and American Indian Alaska Native. We provide some information about the proportions of two or more races in Hawaiian Pacific Islander students in the report, even though we were not able to produce projections for these populations separately because of insufficient data. You can find more detail about the data and methodology in Appendix C of the publication. So let's begin with the national trends for high school graduates. The big national headlines are that despite the recent improvements in the official high school graduation rate, the sheer number of youth is going to plateau. This leads to a slowdown and even declines in the number of high school graduates. And underlying the limited growth and eventual decreased number of high school graduates are long predicted decreases in the number of white youth, including those who attend and graduate from private schools and growing non-white student populations. I believe there may be a problem with the slides. You should be seeing on the slides a chart that has two charts right now that illustrate the projected national trends. The chart on the left shows the populations of public school graduates by race ethnicity plus graduates of private high schools from the first projected year to the last. The top line shows the total and several counts over these 18 years. The line chart on the right indicates the year-over-year -year increase or decrease in the number of each population of graduates over those years compared to, those, to their numbers from the last confirmed school year, 2012-13. In total, after almost two decades of steady growth in the number of high school graduates, averaging about 2% annually, the nation reached a high of about 3.44 million graduates around 2013. Between now and about 2025, pardon me, so we should be back. I apologize for that delay. Um, between now and about 2025, there is virtually no increase projected except for a few years of small increases around 2025 when the nation will produce about 3.56 million high school graduates. After 2025, the number of high school graduates nationally is projected to decrease steadily to about 3.3 million, or about 7% fewer by around 2030. These decreases in the outer years arise from long predicted contraction of the white youth population compounded by dramatic birth declines for all populations during and after the Great Recession. A couple points to note. The white public school graduates are projected to decrease by 17% by the early 2030s, or about about a quarter million fewer graduates than in 2013. Just over 15 years ago, whites represented 70% of all high school graduates, but by the end of the projections, they are projected to be 52% of public school graduates. Hispanic high school graduates are the primary growth population, increasing almost 50% by 2025 from 640,000 in 2013 to almost 900,000. 
during the growth years, the additional number of Hispanic graduates more than offsets the declines of white graduates. But there, even Hispanic graduates are projected to decrease in number by between 2025 and the early 2030s as a result of the recent birth declines, which were greatest among Hispanics. Asian Pacific Islander graduates are the only population projected to increase throughout, but they are only about 5 to 7 percent of the total number of graduates nationally, so their numbers don't shift the overall trend of decline. Black high school graduates are about 15 percent of the national total, and they will be relatively steady in numbers throughout the projections. The number of American Indian Alaska Native students nationally are very small compared to other student populations, but overall there is a decline. And high school graduates from private religious and independent schools are projected to decrease by about 26% or about 80,000 graduates in reflection of their largely white student demographic, but also due to significant tra contraction among religious schools over the last decade or so. We were unable to produce separate counts for Hawaiian Pacific Islander graduates or two or more race graduates because of data limitations. But recent years indicated Hawaiian Pacific Islander graduates are about 7% of the combined Asian total, or about 10,000 high school graduates in recent years. Gradu graduates of multiple races have represented between 1 to 3% of non-Hispanic public high school graduates in recent years. You will, however, see that the national projections mask significant variations by region and among the states. Before we get started, I want to show the regional divisions as defined in Knocking at the College Door. The following slides will, follow, or will focus on the states in gold. Here we see those regional differences. The number of graduates for each region you see here is the region's high point. The southern region produces about 43% of the nation's high school graduates. While the West has long produced the most diverse classes of high school graduates and the greatest number of Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander graduates, by the early 2020s, the Southern region will surpass the West in the number of Hispanic high school graduates and will rival the West in terms of diversity. The, Northwest, or the Northeast and Midwest reached their high points for high school graduates in the school year 2009-10. As you can see, the number of graduates from these regions have already begun decreasing and will continue to decline throughout the projected years. And now let's shift and take a closer look at the trends for the southern region. The south is the engine of growth for high school graduates. The region will generate about 10% more graduates in 2025 than in 2013, and is primarily responsible for the growth predicted for the nation around 2025. The south is the only region that will produce more high school graduates in the early 2030s than it does now, and about 45% of the nation's graduates will be from the southern region by 2030. While well, white high school graduates are projected to decline by 7% by the early 2030s, or about 40,000 fewer than in 2013, the decline in the South is about half the magnitude as other regions. Hispanics are projected to increase by 43% compared to 2013, from 229,000 to 328,000. The number of black high school graduates is relatively stable throughout the years projected at about 266,000 per year with all the growth in the South coming from other minority graduates. Asian Pacific Islander graduates almost double, increasing from 39,000 to 71,000. And there were ra rapid increases of American Indian Alaska Native high school graduates between 2000 and 2010 from 8,000 to 12,000, but going forward they are projected to decrease in number almost as rapidly back to about 8,000 by the early 2030s. And finally, the South saw rapid growth of private high school graduates between 2000 and 2010, but they are projected to decline by about 23 percent from 96,000 in 2013 to about 73,000 in the early 2030s. This table is designed to give a snapshot of where the declines in growth are in the region by showing the cumulative percent change of each of the states within the region from 2012-13 to 2024-25. What is notable here is that the two states that contribute the highest numbers of high school graduates, Texas and Florida, are both listed under robust increase. The next highest contributors, North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia, fall into moderate or robust increase. Finally, let's take a quick look at each of the states in the South. Hopefully some of the similarities and differences jump out at you seeing the states side by side. The Southern region as a whole is shown again. 
And one point of note, if a state is not projected to exceed the number of graduates in 2013, or in other words, it does not have a new high, you will only see the starting and ending number of graduates. The states are in order by the size of the contribution to the number of high school graduates. It's a way of thinking about state size. Again, you can see that most of the growth in the region comes from several states. The southern region includes three of the states that are in the top ten nationally in terms of contributions of high school graduates. Texas is the second highest producer for the nation and generates 27% of the South's graduates. The additional graduates in Texas account for almost half of the additional graduates from the South in the new high point around 2025. And while the nation is expected to produce about 200,000 fewer graduates in the early 2030s than in recent years, at the same time, Texas will be generating about 45,000 more. Florida generates about 14 percent of the South's graduates, and the percentage of non-white graduates will increase about 9 percent to about 60 percent of the total. North Carolina is the 10th highest producer for the nation and 8 percent of the South. By 2032, the non-white population will be about 47 percent of the total. Georgia, which generates about 8 percent of the South's graduates, and Virginia, 7 percent, both are expected to see about an 8% increase in their non-white population. Tennessee and Maryland will also see increases in their non-white population, 6% and 9% respectively. And while Alabama overall is expected to decline in the number of high school graduates, the state will see a slight uptick in the non-white population. And finally, South Carolina will lose a couple percentage points in their non-white share because of almost equal decreases of black graduates as in the increases of whites, about 2,000 each. Kentucky overall will see a decrease in the graduates, but will experience more diversity. And Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Arkansas will all see about a 6 to 7 percent increase in the share of their non-white population. And finally, the declines in Mississippi and West Virginia are both reflected here. The decline in Delaware um, after a fairly substantial increase should be noted. And while D.C. shows a very steep increase, the numbers are quite small. And interestingly, there are increasing uh, recent white enrollments that leads to some trends that are the opposite of what we're seeing elsewhere in the country. I'd like to conclude my remarks by saying that in addition to the handouts that you can download in this presentation, you can obtain the projections in a variety of formats by going to our website which is listed on our materials, but it's www.knocking.witchy.edu. You can get PDF copies of the report, which includes the state-by-state -state data tables in Appendix A. You can also download the projections as an Excel file on the data page, and you can view state, regional, and national profiles about the projections. I'd like to now turn to our respondents and invite them to offer their comments. I'm going to turn first to Susan and ask her to please provide a short introduction to SREB, describe her role there, her initial impressions of the knocking trends, and perhaps talk about her use of the data in her work. Thanks, Demi. Um, as Demi said, um, I'm Susan Lounsbury, and I'm the Director of Education Data Services at SREB. Um, like Richie, um, the SREB is uh, one of four regional education compacts in the U.S. And uh, what makes us different, though, from the other regional compacts is that we, um, we serve all levels of public education, it's from early childhood to doctoral education, not just post-secondary education. So monitoring the education pipeline, including the number of high school graduates, is critical to much of what we do. Um, you might be familiar with two of our high-profile products, the State Progress Reports and the Factbook on Higher Education. And both publications include data on a wide range of topics, including high school graduates. And one goal in producing these publications is to provide policymakers at the state and institution or school level with data on the education pipeline in their state and throughout the region. So Wichi's knocking at the college door is a, is a critical resource for us in this effort. Um, just sort of reflecting on some of the findings that 
that Demi mentioned, uh, they, uh, they reinforce much of what we have found in our work on the state progress reports and the higher, and the higher education fact book. Uh, for example, we, we too have found evidence of a shift in the racial ethnic composition of the student population. Specifically, we found that the proportion of black and white students enrolled in public schools um, in, in elementary and secondary education has um, decreased while uh, that of um, the Hispanic population has grown. So. Uh, According to the data that we have, Hispanic students accounted for about 7% of students enrolled in elementary and secondary education in 2003, but that grew to 13% in 2013, and that's for the region. Um, in addition, our work has um, also shed light on the fact that, that there is an increasing percentage of children living in poverty and low-income households during that same time frame. And uh, and so it's encouraging to see, since these can be barriers or hurdles to students completing um, high school, uh, graduating from high school, it's encouraging to see that despite those potential hurdles that um, the projections are, are calling for um, the southern region to see an increase in the number of high school graduates. So... Um, I guess I'll stop there, and um, just that gives you a taste of of why we um, uh, why we look to the the high school graduate projections uh, each time for uh, our work as well. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm going to ask each respondent to just take three minutes or so to describe his or her organization or institution, including um, his or her role, as well as their initial impressions of Knocking's findings. David, I'll turn to you first. Pleasure to be with you. Uh, can everyone hear me now? I'll begin again. Thanks, Demi, and welcome to everyone who's online, uh, several of whom I know. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you to speak about some of the daunting challenges that we face in Tennessee, but also several of the exciting policies, programs, and best practices we're developing in response to those challenges. As the coordinating board for post-secondary education in the state, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission, or as we're commonly known, PHEC, has wide-ranging responsibilities for master planning, budgeting, tuition setting, capital construction and maintenance, academic pro uh, program approval and monitoring, oversight of for-profit and other post-secondary schools, veterans education, and collecting post-secondary data uh, and doing uh, annual reporting as required by statute and carrying out our own program of applied research. But relative to, today, to today's topic, one of the most important and exciting duties that we have is to carry the torch for the statewide college completion agenda, which was embodied in the College uh, Complete College Tennessee Act of 2010 and reaffirmed by Governor Bill Haslam's Drive to 55 initiative in 2013, which continues to this day. At the heart of the Drive to 55 is a goal that enjoys broad buy-in from within and outside the higher education community. That 55% of Tennessee's working age adults will have earned a college degree or hold a high-quality post-secondary certificate or credential by the year 2025. While every one of us has a stake in the Drive to 55, THEC bears res primary responsibility for creating and implementing a series of initiatives best practices and policy reforms in pursuit of this overarching goal. The Drive to 55 has animated our work here at THEC for close to 10 years now, and I suspect it will continue to do so for years to come. So as for the knocking report, knocking at the college door, in light of this, Wichi's most recent report presents us in Tennessee with some stark realities that demand action at all levels of education, as well as our workforce and economic development agencies. For starters, our traditional age college population, college going population, is not going to get a lot bigger, but at the same time it will become more diverse. And furthermore, I was surprised to learn that our stock of private high school graduates is projected to decrease by about a third over the period of the uh, projections. So uh, broadly speaking, we can't just do a better job of serving the base population of high school graduates that we've traditionally served, traditionally enrolled. We have to increase our college going rate, which has already started to happen, and we have to reach out to new populations of students, students who are first generation, low income, 
might be less well prepared academically and who might be more interested in short-term job skills training such as apprenticeships and post-secondary certificates and diplomas over the traditional degree program programs offered by one of our colleges and universities. In my next comments, I'll get into more of the details of how we're doing that. But I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Thank you, David. We appreciate you being here. Jean, would you please uh, care to offer your thoughts? Yes, Kate. Uh, yes, thank you. I think uh, for Mississippi, along with post-secondary, a lot of what David said stands for Mississippi also. But from my role as Associate Superintendent for Secondary Education, we're actually looking at these graduation numbers. We're trying to improve our graduation rate. But I think the, this report lets us really begin to look at our gap between our subgroups. If we're going to improve our attainment rate, if we're going to reach those goals in Mississippi that are similar to the ones that David talks about for Tennessee, we're going to have to look at the high school and see what we can do in high school to close the achievement gap between all the subgroups. If we're going to decline in the number of students we have and increase in the other subgroups, then that gap must be addressed, and we've got to address it at the K-12 in order to meet the needs of post-secondary and in order to meet the economic needs of our state. Thank you, Jean. And Kate, let's hear from you next. Great, and hopefully my, my audio is working a little bit better now. My name is Kate Akers. I am the Executive Director of the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics. We uh, represent Kentucky's longitudinal data system. This is an early learning through workforce centralized database housed within the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet for the state of Kentucky. Our work and in in our mission of our office is to collect and integrate data so that policymakers, practitioners, and the general public have the information that they need to make policy decisions. We consider some of this work, which, which I um, really commend this team for, um, to be a huge part of that. So what we have in our system are the past and, and current information as to enrollment, who we expect to graduate, um, and who has graduated in the past and their college going rates and their entry into the workforce is also a big piece of the work that we do. So what this report allows us to do is to be proactive, as some of the other panelists mentioned as well. It allows us to take that type of information, apply it to the trends that we have seen historically for those different populations, and then to think about what will that impact be on both post-secondary and the workforce. As we reflect on Kentucky's data and we see um, increases um, in minority uh, graduation or graduates specifically, this allows us to plan and think about what specifically those college going rates for those different for those different populations look like and allows us to plan for that. So we're thankful for this report and for our continued partnership. Thank you, Kate. Jean, I'd like to focus on K-12 for a moment. We have just heard about the shifting demographics that are already being seen in the K-12 schools. Overall, there's increasing diversity, largely fueled by fewer white students and increasing numbers of Hispanic and Asian students, and although fewer numbers for the Asian students. And we know that historically there have been achievement gaps between white students and students of color. Can you discuss what these projections mean for schools in Mississippi and give us some examples of what schools in your state have been doing to improve academic performance and college readiness for all students? Glass. Yes, I'll be glad to do that. We have seen a tremendous increase in our English language, language learner population. We're having to do a lot of work around those areas. So that has been a major focus for us. But then another focus for us has truly been the gap between our African Americans and our whites. That's a gap in our state that has been there for quite a while. We have we have seen some narrowing, but not to the degree that we need. And I think for a K-12 school, this has really got to begin in our pre-K, K-3 areas around our literacy that we 
we have really put a big emphasis on literacy and reading when you leave third grade on level. Now, this will take several years before we see the results of the middle school and the high school, but that is an area of a lot of focus for the moving through. But I think in the meantime, what we're doing on the high school level for 912 is to begin to look at areas that we can really focus on to improve, especially in math and science and literacy for where our gaps are. We've worked a lot with the Southern Region Education Board. We've been able to see that a number of our students are leaving high school not ready for college work. We've worked very closely with our eight public universities and our 15 community college to look at how we can refocus that senior year and students that are not ready at the end of the 11th grade to do college work, post-secondary work, even career readiness work, what can we do in that senior year to change the focus and to begin to give those students more intense work before they exit high school? We've been one of the states that has worked with SREB on their math ready and their literacy ready courses. We've implemented in those in our high schools where our teachers go through the training, they receive certification, and our IHLs have a policy now that if a student goes through these two courses, have an 80 GPA at the end of their senior year in those courses, they'll allow students to enter post-secondary without remediation and going on into those gateway courses in English and math. This is, this is an area that we feel like that we've seen results over the last year, that students are going to be able to move through post-secondary, whether it's community college, ITL, an ITL for us to our eight public universities at a much quicker pace in order to complete their degree post-secondary. Uh, so we're working in those areas around remediation. We're working now with both the community colleges and the IHL on a P20 initiative to see what other areas we can work through as, as in high school to improve. But we're looking at areas to improve the remediation from high school to post-secondary and how we can build more dual credit courses into our high school that have students that are first-generation college goers interested in completing work. So we're doing a lot around what we can do with remediation, but we're working very, very closely with our post-secondary institutions to align what we're doing, not only in the remediation, but in the coursework itself in our career, our Mississippi College for Revenue Stand. Thank you, Jean. David, I'll turn to you next. The knocking projections show um, that for Tennessee, that moderate growth of about 5% through about 2024, 25, and then a dip back down to lower than current numbers. From where you sit at a state agency, what does that tell you about what the state needs to do going forward, and what has Tennessee done already that you think you can build on? OK, thanks, Demi. Uh, well, <clears throat> the long-range trends that are shown in uh, your latest Knocking at the College Door report demand a uh, response, not only from within the education circles, but from our partners in business and industry and our workforce and economic development agencies as well. So in Tennessee, we've taken a two-pronged approach addressing challenges in both secondary and post-secondary education in the state because, uh, as you pointed out, um, we're not going to be able to just depend on this uh, growth swell from the ranks of our traditional college age uh, and college going populations. So first, with respect to the secondary level, and I've just got a few things listed with respect to secondary and post-secondary. Through a federal uh, gear up grant that's multi-year in nature, we reach out to middle and high school students and their families in underserved schools and underserved counties to increase those students' engagement, college-going, and post-secondary success. Uh, secondly, driven by the belief that every student has the potential to benefit from post-secondary education and training, Advise Tennessee aims to increase the number of Tennesseans accessing higher education by partnering with high schools to provide college advising and coaching services inside the school to some 10,000 high school juniors and seniors across Tennessee. We have a robust program of dual enrollment, dual credit, and AP offerings in order to give high school students early exposure to college-level work 
and give them the opportunity to earn college credits while they're in high school, thereby building confidence and momentum. Our Tennessee Lottery Scholarship Program, which has been in effect now for well over uh, a dozen years, that program ensures that students can take at least two dual enrollment courses in high school for free, no cost to them. Our Seamless Alignment and Integrated Learning Support Program, or SAILS as it's called, uh, uses high school juniors ACT results to offer bridge math, a bridge math course in high school during the senior year to reduce and preempt the need for college remedial and developmental instruction in college, and that's shown great success. And then lastly, at the secondary level, we offer the Tennessee Promise, which, a last, which is a last dollar scholarship that ensures that no Tennessee high school graduate will have to pay a dime out of pocket for community college tuition and fees. And while this has gotten most of the headlines, perhaps just as important as the free tuition guarantee is that the program joins every Promise student with a volunteer mentor who meets with and stays in touch with that student throughout his or her college selection process and on into their post-secondary enrollment. As it relates to post-secondary education, um, the latest knocking report and other similar, similar analyses that we've had done have driven us to the unmistakable conclusion that Tennessee must go all in with regard to improving collegiate access and success for our massive population of potential adult learners. Tennessee has close to one million adult citizens that have some college but no degree, and tapping into this population is perhaps the key to meeting the goals of the Drive to 55 that I mentioned before. Therefore, we've taken the following steps to, relative to adult learners in our post-secondary policy setting. First, the state of Tennessee no longer funds its public institutions on the basis of enrollment, but solely on completions and other momentum points, and an, and an adult learner who completes uh, post-secondary education or training carries nearly twice the weight of a non-adult completer in that process. That, therefore, we ensure that uh, Tennessee's institutions will um, double down on their efforts to enroll and help those students succeed. By the way, I should also mention that underprepared community college students and low-income students, students who are Pell eligible, also carry this same uh, premium under our outcomes-based funding formula. Secondly, we offer a robust program of prior learning assessment, or PLA, which provides adults with the opportunity to earn significant amounts of college credit for demonstrated knowledge, skills, and competencies, saving those, students, adult, uh, those adult students significant time and expense. And then lastly, Tennessee Reconnect is an umbrella title for a set of initiatives that we offer uh, to offer wraparound advising and support services for adults in one of our Tennessee Reconnect communities sprinkled throughout the state who might be considering enrolling or re-enrolling in post-secondary education. And Tennessee Reconnect all, also refers to uh, one of the scholarships that enable any adult learner who is a Tennessee resident the ability to attend one of our 13 community colleges or 27 colleges of applied technology ability to attend one of those schools at no cost to them in terms of tuition and required fees. Um, I mentioned a lot of different specific programs and initiatives and you can go online and find out more about those on our commission's website which is tn.gov forward slash THEC. Thank you. Thank you David. And Kay, I'd like to turn to you next. You know, you have a slightly different perspective from your office. Can you comment on how you have seen these data used by either folks in your office or um, others in your state and what they might mean specifically for Kentucky. Certainly. So we are using these data and coupling with, again, kind of the historical data that we see um, throughout our system. So one of the, the main initiatives that, that we have is the alignment of all of our current state initiatives. So that, in, that would, of course, involve some of this work as well as additional work from SREB um, and our other state partners to really focus on um, the alignment between education and workforce. And in Kentucky, we don't just say education to workforce pipeline. We really believe it's a, it's a whole system approach. So using these data, we're able to see what we anticipate that impact to be first on the education side and then what we would anticipate seeing 
on the workforce side. So what's new in Kentucky that is, is very much um, as a, a factor of, of this report is the actual alignment of all these initiatives. So this isn't just a, a K-12 conversation. It's not just a career tech ed conversation or a conversation that we have with our community colleges or our four-year colleges or something that employers are just sitting around and talking about. It's a conversation that's now happening throughout the state from kind of um, the beginning of where we first began talking about education um, and then, of course, on into workforce. And this is really the first time that we're seeing this. And it's not just individuals coming together and, and, and talking about what may happen, but it's actual commitment to alignment, um, which, is, which is very new. So as Kentucky sees the changes in the predicted demographics, in um, you know, knowing that there aren't tons more graduates, um, as you guys can see from the Kentucky data, but that the graduates um, have a, dem a different demographic makeup, we're able to apply this to quite a bit of the workforce planning and the education pipeline planning that we have. One specific strategy that we are working on in Kentucky is access to dual credit and advanced placement opportunities. We have shown these two um, examples specifically as a way to increase um, specifically minority students, their likelihood of going to college, of being successful in college, and then obtaining a job in a field that um, pays some sort of sustaining wage. So those are some of the kind of key priorities and really the emphasis that we have in Kentucky right now. Thank you, Kate. And I have another question for Jean before we turn over to Q&A from the participants. Many promising efforts around the country that have demonstrated improved academic performance involve partnerships and collaboration between K-12 and higher education. Would you like to comment on partnership efforts that you know of or are involved in that have demonstrated success with students? Sure. I think one of those would be our partnership with the, in the senior year of making sure that students that are leaving high school ready, and that would be our readiness class that I talked about earlier, where our IHL accepts students that meet that GPA average to enter high college without the remediation from the ACT team. I think another piece that we have is a lot of what everyone talks about, the AP, increasing AP access to all students, especially students that have not always been considered AP students and giving them the ability to move forward. The dual credit, dual enrollment is huge and it's not just big on the academic side. We've got to do more about increasing dual enrollment, dual credit with our career and technical fields, which we have a very strong articulation agreement with our community college where students earn career and technical credit in high school will be given uh, almost like AP where they are able to articulate those credits on the post-secondary with to complete associate degrees or certifications earlier. A couple of other areas that I think are important in bridging a bit, uh, high school and post-secondary are in the certification areas and working with our workforce, our community college, to make sure that first-generation students understand that there are even more opportunities out there than just a four-year university, and that through these articulation agreements, post-secondary needs, workforce needs, that certifications are of great value. So we're beginning to look at what does it really mean for educational attainment, and what are the many different areas that we can work together. And we're seeing a very strong piece between K-12, community college, and IHL with articulation agreements all the way through where we have reverse transfer credits, things of that nature, to make sure that students in high school have a clear pathway to where they can go, what those on and off ramps are, to be sure that as we're working as one educational group, not three separate ones in our state. Thank you, Jean. 
So I would like to, at this time, invite participants to enter any questions that they have either about the data or for our panelists into the question box. And in the meantime, I will pose one final question if any of the respondents would like to respond. And that is, from each of your perspectives, what should state or institutional policymakers, either at the K-12 or higher education uh, uh, levels consider in light of these projections and we'll wait to see if there are any questions in the meantime and I will unmute everybody if anybody wants to if anybody would like to just jump in and respond to that question about the policy unmuted um, this is David am I unmuted can I you are you are you may okay great thank you um, without a, 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 I've already talked a lot about a lot of specifics but I I see the Witchy report is part just of an ongoing movement, trend, conversation that we have to broaden our, our minds and the scope of what we think is possible to make post-secondary education and training in its many forms and modalities uh, available to quantum leap uh, broader numbers of, of people, whether they're uh, recent high school graduates or people that have been out in the workforce a while and decided to come back are people who started higher education many years ago and now want to come back. So we have to break down the silos and the barriers in our frameworks that we've used for so many years uh, to take this kind of massive increase in attendance and success to, to a much greater scale than what we've done before. And, that, and that's the reason why uh, I'm listing all these things that we're doing and trying to pull all of our, align all of our policies and programs so that they're all pulling in the same direction to greater aspiration in Tennessee and greater attainment. And these things cross our fiscal policies, our institutional policies, our state policies, academic, and on and on and on. Thank you for your remarks. Um, if any of the other panelists would like to respond to that, uh, you're unmuted for the moment. And I don't see any questions coming through just yet, so we'll give a few more minutes in case any do arise. And if you think of any later, you are welcome to uh, email us at any time. I will post our emails up here at this point. And I would like to extend a warm thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be with us today and to all of you for attending and contributing um, your time this afternoon. Um, if you think of a question, as I mentioned, that, um, that, come up, that comes up later, we are happy to email or talk to you on the phone. Um, I will leave the webinar open for a little bit longer in case something strikes you. Um, there will be a very brief evaluation survey as you exit the webinar, which we hope you will take the time to complete. And you will receive an email notification when the recording is available. So please feel free to share it with any colleagues who are not able to attend today. And again, um, our emails are available on the screen. You can sign up for email notifications about the knocking at the college door projections and any additional reports we may produce in the future. Sign up for webinars about the other regional trends um, at, knocking at, at the knocking at the college door website. So I will leave this open for a little bit, but if you are leaving at this point, we wish you a great afternoon. And um, uh, wait, sorry. I think somebody wants to be unmuted. Susan does. Susan has some final comments, so we will give the floor over to her. Sorry. Um, one thing no, that, um, that occurred to me um, as we were talking is that uh, I think college affordability is certainly something that policymakers need to be thinking about, and I think a lot, a lot of folks in our states are th already thinking about these things. David highlighted um, work that uh, Tennessee is doing, and I know that Georgia is also working on some things. Um, but given that uh, the students that are the student, the, the portion of the student population that is expected to increase um, may face uh, more barriers in terms of financial barriers to attending college. So I think that's something that has to be on the minds of policymakers. Yes, and um, thank you for raising that, Susan. And SREB has done quite a bit of work in that area, and if there is something on the website that you'd like to point our participants to, feel free to do that. I'm, I, you know better than, than I do. About yeah, that. I mean, if, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if you are interested in finding um, out where your state falls in terms of um, college affordability, I would encourage you to take a look at the SRAB website where you'll find the college affordability profiles. There are state profiles for each of the SRAB states. Um, it gives you an idea of, of how affordable college is, post-secondary education is in your state, um, and it breaks it down by, um, by uh, income levels. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, it does not look like we have any other questions. If um, any of the respondents have any, it doesn't look like anybody has anything else. So I just wish you all a great afternoon. And thank you so much for taking the time for being with us here today. Thank you.